Thank you, Whitney. I think while uh, Whitney didn't put it quite so bluntly, what he really wants to know is what the hell Jackson was doing, Jackson Jr. was doing at Nuremberg. Uh, let me start briefly with the background of the trial. Uh, you all, of course, remember the debate that was going on in early 1945 uh, with respect to the punishment of the Nazi leaders, whether it should be by summary execution or by trial. And as you know, Mr. Churchill and Mr. Stalin were for summary execution, as was our Secretary of State, Mr. Hull. But the President, Franklin Roosevelt, was uncommitted. In April of that year, my father made a speech to the American Society of International Law, in which he said, in essence, if the Nazi leaders are to be executed, it must be by military or political decision, not involving the judicial system. But if they are to be tried, it must be a real trial on evidence of complicity and a fair trial in which the accused may defend themselves so that only the right men are convicted and for the right reason. <coughs> this reasoning apparently persuaded President Roosevelt and his counsel, uh, Judge Rosenman, who, with the aid of Harry Hopkins, started out to try to convert the British. After <clears throat> Mr. Truman succeeded Mr. Roosevelt, he and uh, Judge Rosenman sounded out my father uh, in May of 1945 about being appointed as the representative of the United States to negotiate an agreement for an international trial and also to prosecute the case on behalf of the United States. My father was concerned about his duties as a justice of the court. He thought it was essential that he should return by the first Monday in October so that his absence would not affect the normal functioning of the court. Judge Rosenman said, look, the United States has the, all the major prisoners. The War Department has volumes of documents. The trial should be short, and the justice can return to court in October. Judge Roseman undoubtedly believed this to be so, but as you all know, it was a monumental overstatement. There were loads of documents, yes, but they were untranslated, they were undigested, they were unanalyzed, and the work had hardly begun. In any event, my father accepted and got to work, uh, including the recruiting of the staff. Uh, he invited me to join the team as his personal assistant. I was only recently admitted to the bar and this was my first case. I was obviously not chosen for proven legal ability, although my father was not disappointed that I had been an editor of the Harvard Law Review. And I didn't need a job, I had one. I was a naval officer assigned to the Bureau of Ships. I think I was chosen because I was familiar with his ways of working and thinking and deciding. Someone he could trust to handle details and implement the performance of courses and initiatives that he had decided upon. To be his confident and right hand, but not his alter ego. My first assignment <clears throat> was to assist in the four power negotiations for agreement on an international tribunal to try the principal Nazi government leaders. The conference began at Church House in the bombed out city of London. 
at the end of June 1945. <clears throat> I attended the conference throughout until agreement was reached in early August. Of course, my father had other advisors, <clears throat> but I contributed what I could to his efforts to convince the other delegations on various points of disagreement. These included the planning and conduct of aggressive war as a war crime. This was the cornerstone of his position in those negotiations. Also, the need to define aggression and the ingredients of a common plan and conspiracy. In addition to this, there was the drafting and redrafting of proposed protocols or agreements and amendments regarding the trial, and study, analysis, and comments on drafts <coughs> circulated by other delegations. Throughout, the other three delegations were in no hurry. The Soviet group delayed the beginning of the meetings by being uh, several days late in arriving. <coughs> And later, they refused my father's invitation to visit Nuremberg as a possible site of the trial, which necessitated a second visit at their convenience. But my father was infused with a sense of urgency. Unlike his counterparts, he was not only a negotiator of the agreement, but also the chief prosecutor for the United States. The three other countries had not appointed prosecutors. My father goaded them to get on with the job so that the trial preparations could proceed. He noted with emphasis that the Americans had the most prominent prisoners, were busily collecting evidence, and that they would go it alone if the others did not move quickly. With the agreement and charter finally agreed upon and signed, the next event was the selection of documents and the drafting of an indictment. The Soviet delegation wanted to charge the Germans with the massacre of 11,000 Polish officers who were prisoners of war in the forest of Katyn near Smolensk. My father had been informed that the massacre was carried out by the Soviets, not by the Germans, and sent me to the War Department in Washington to find out what evidence military intelligence had on this matter. And I was able to report that G2 was satisfied from forensic and other evidence that the crime had been committed at a time when Soviet troops had control of the area. Based on this information, my father refused to charge the crime against the Germans, and heated discussions with the Soviets took place. Finally, a compromise was reached. The charge was phrased in the passive voice. 11,000 prisoners of war were killed, and my father advised the Soviets that the United States would have nothing to do with this matter, but would expect the Soviets to produce whatever evidence they had. The tribunal did not decide the issue, but a few years ago, a new Russian Federation admitted that the crime was carried out by the Soviet troops.